Welcome. Welcome to the second semester. I'm glad you're all here. Um, this, I think, will be one of the most unusual, fun uh, lectures that we've ever had, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I get the honor of introducing Beth Owens, who was a student of mine, and I forgot. I was going to bring you a picture of her when she was 19. I still have it in my office. Uh, she was a student of mine, and at that time I used to take pictures, and the other day I was throwing away pictures, and oh my god, I think I know this woman. So I've got a picture of Beth when she was 19, and I'm taking a, as it turns out it was micro. I, 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 for some reason I wrote Econ micro in the back. Uh, those of you who are first year and second year students, if you want to do something in marketing, promotion, uh, event planning, uh, sales, this is the woman you need to see. Uh, she takes an intern every semester. Uh, she has her own company. If you want to see what happens top to bottom, uh, and you want somebody that's very dynamic, uh, who has done stuff with people who sell motorcycles, who build motorcycles, who make movies. Uh, the movie coming out, what's it called? The Fastest? World's Fastest Indian. World's Fastest Indian. Does anybody know that? It's going to come out in a week or so. It's about a, it's not about Hawaii Indians, right, running. It's about a motorcycle, right? There used to be a motorcycle company called the Indian. And this guy ended up, how, it's a true story. How fast did he go? Um, over 200 miles an hour. And then the bottom of the Yeah, and uh, he did it not when he was a young man either. Over 60 years old. Over 60 years old, and he sort of put together his own motorcycle. So Beth has been promoting that particular film. Uh, she's in the process of uh, doing a restaurant also. And the guy said, look, I'll hire you. You're good. But I want to see how good you are. Get me on national TV in the next 30 days and you've got a contract. And so her challenge is to get this guy on TV in the next 30 days. I've got a dollar says it happens. Because uh, I know Beth and I, I'm sure if it doesn't happen, she's going to be really close. So it's a real honor uh, for me to introduce Beth, who's going to introduce our very special guest tonight. And by the way, look over here. Make sure you see the neatest Marvin's Delivers uh, sign that's ever been uh, made. So uh, Marvin's Delivers to Dallas. <laughs> Beth? Do you want to talk? It's so for coming this evening. Of course, Dr. Lemon always, you know, I always get concerned when he's at the podium just what stories he's going to share. As he mentioned, I did graduate from DuPont. Uh, I was in the class of 1989. I was a Spanish major and poli-sci minor. And uh, then after DuPont, I went on and got my master's in international management. Um, did international sales for a number of years out of college and then was involved in a manufacturing setting where um, the CEO of a company decided to start a second business, which then became American Iron Horse Motorcycle Company, which is based in Fort Worth, Texas. It's a production custom manufacturer of high-end, look good, go fast motorcycles. And it was in this setting that I met um, this very special man, Rick Fairless, um, as the VP of Marketing and Sales at American Iron Horse, one of my uh, duties was to not only promote the brand, but to work with dealers in a number of different initiatives. And so I got to meet a lot of really interesting and dynamic um, motorcycle enthusiasts, dealer operators, and designers, and Rick is all of the above. And interestingly enough, as corporate America um, can throw you a, a curveball in November of 2003, I was laid off from my position at American Iron Horse and faced with the uh, kind of daunting task of figuring out what my next great adventure was going to be. And it was in an exchange of emails, and I'm not sure if he really realizes kind of the impact of a couple of, you know, one line or two sentences conversations on email, but, you know, I had said goodbye to a number of the uh, the dealers that I had worked with closely, and Rick had emailed me back on Thanksgiving, as I recall, because he works every day, and he said, you know, I might need some marketing help. You know, you might want to give me a call. And so sure enough, about a month after I left American Iron Horse, I partnered with two of my former colleagues. We started Brandera, and Rick Fairless was our very first account. And in the last two years, we've worked very hard on 
building his brand as a nationally known celebrity uh, bike designer. He's the owner of Rick Fairless Strokers Dallas in Dallas, Texas. He also owns the Strokers Ice House, which is a really great bar and grill that's co-located on the property. He's the star of his own TV show called Texas Hard Tales, and he's done a number of you know, motorcycle events throughout the United States. He and Megan are going to talk about some of those special events, but you know, over the last two years, I've really seen how you know, focusing your energies and really developing a plan, you can make anything happen. So one of the messages that I hope you get from tonight's lecture is about pursuing your dreams, because this is one guy that got it done. So with that, I'd like to introduce Rick Fairless, and then I'd also like to introduce Megan DeFru. She was an intern, we interned with uh, Brandera last year. She was the first intern um, at Brandera. I'd had a number of interns when I was at American Iron Horse, and so she helped pave the way at our small firm. And uh, I'm really excited to get to see her tonight and have her, you know, kind of do a little Q&A session with Rick so you can hear the whole story. Thanks. Once I get him out, I'm gonna I'm gonna 
make everything a little bit bigger. Because we run out of space, you know, we have all those people there. I don't have enough space for parking. You know, I can park about 1,500 bikes on my property, and then they start filling up across the street, down the street, in the street, in the grass, wherever they can find. So I need to do something to try to correct that. Um, can you give us some background now just about the custom motorcycle market in general? Uh, the, the custom motorcycle market over the past, say, five, six years has been way up at the top, and now it's settling down. And what's happening is a lot of these people, you know, have opened up in the past five years that thought that was normal business. It hasn't been. So we're seeing a lot of companies that have opened up in the past four or five years go out of business. There was a, there was a competitor of mine Terrell, Texas, which is probably 30 miles from me, East Texas Choppers, shut down this last weekend. You know, I mean, it's, it's people think, hey, you know what, I'm going to go in the motorcycle business and I'm going to have some fun and make me some money. It ain't that easy. It's, it's a business like any other business. You've got to work. Um, so one of the names some of the people here might be familiar with is obviously Harley Davidson. How do they fit into the custom motorcycle market and the trends that are in the market right now? Harley Davidson is like the grandpa, you know. I mean, that's where it all starts and that's where it ends. But where we're big dog and American Iron Horse come in is that, you know, the, the natural transition is, okay, you buy a Harley. Okay, I got a Harley. I got to chrome this. I got to chrome that. I got to put a change the carburetor. I got to, you know, make it cool. When you buy an American Iron Horse, they're already done. You know, they come with custom paint, different things. That's not an American Iron Horse, but American Iron Horse is similar to that in that you can order the paint that you want, and you don't have to, you know, spend 20 grand on Harley, then spend another 10, 20 grand trying to make it individual. You know, you can you can buy your American Iron Horse already the way you want. Um, and also, along with American Iron Horse, now you can also buy the Rick Fairless Customs. Right. Did you have Rick Fairless with the brand in itself? No. That's, that's my lovely wife Susan there with me. This bike that, that I'm leaning on is a Coors bike. You can see the, the gas tanks on it look like, like beer cans. And we did this in conjunction with the... With the uh, y'all are college students who like that, right? <laughs> but we did, we, we did that in conjunction with the Coors people. You know, it's, it's a theme bike. You know, the, the, the uh, front forks are painted up like Q-sticks. It's just, uh, you know, it's a theme box built around my, uh, my ice house. Do you have other bikes that you, uh, you have a favorite bike at all that you've done? The Coors bike is? The Coors bike is probably, probably my most famous bike. I've got a bike that uh, in 1964, I've got a 1961 Triumph. And in 1964, it was my dad's best friend, and he was on his way to our house in Suffolk, and he got killed on that motorcycle. So it sat in our garage, you know, we were kids, and we were just marveled at this thing, you know, we sat on it and all that, and, you know, I, I tell my dad, let's get that old triumph run, you know, because it didn't run for 45 years. And so he brought it over one day, and I got it running. And, you know, I was proud, and he was proud, and I said, what, what do you want to do with this, Dad? He said, well, if you keep it, give it to Steve someday, which is so that's like my, you know, if I had to get rid of all the bikes, it's definitely one. Um, going back to your business itself, were you scared when you first opened your business and changing companies so drastically? Uh, I wouldn't say scared, I'd say terrified. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, I was making good money in the paint business, and they let me wear my hair long, and they let me wear a beard, and I wore just normal clothes like I'm wearing with the other guys wore. They wore ties and slacks and that kind of stuff. And uh, it was it was comforting. The only comforting thing was that I knew that I could, if I didn't make it, I could always go back to work for my previous employer. I could always go back to work for Lyndon or Sherwin Williams. That's Debbie, by the way. She's on my TV show. But it, yeah, it was, it was it was very scary, very scary. Um, so now that you've been in now for ten years, what do you enjoy most about owning this? I enjoy the freedom. Y'all keeping a picture of Debbie up there? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, put Debbie back, please. <laughs> it's it's the freedom of owning your own business, you know, because when you when you work for somebody else, you know, and and, and you will work for somebody else. You have to pay your dues. 
you're, you're taking orders, if, even though that you may have a better way of doing something, or you may think, you know, that's baloney, this is the way we ought to do it, you got to do it the boss's way. You know, so owning your own business allows you the freedom of doing what you think is right. Of course, it also allows you to make mistakes, you know, that, that you aren't going to do. Um, what are some of the things that you do different than your competitors that have made you <coughs> so successful and some of the others not so? It's, you know, like my place, you can, you can do anything there. I mean, it's a, it's a destination. You know, it's not like when, when we were younger, we used to go, we'd all meet at the Harley shop, you know, which is down the street from where I'm at. Well, most of the time we wouldn't even go in and we'd all meet at the Harley shop in the parking lot. We didn't go in because it was, you know, all the Harley shops were pretty much the same. We met in the parking lot and there would be 10 or 12 of us, okay, what do you want to do? Well, it was always the same. Let's ride somewhere, eat a hamburger, drink a beer, and go goof around, you know. So that's what we would do. And I thought, okay, now if, if I could get on the shop where they would come every week and, you know, the, the bike people like to be around other bike people. They like to walk around and look at bikes. So, you know, we used to say, hey, what's the perfect shop? My buddy said, the perfect shop is you, you've got glass. You know, you can sit in there and drink a beer and you've got glass where you can see your bikes. You know, because the old deal is, hey, go outside at your turn to check on the bikes. And I said, no, the perfect bar is you can walk outside, carry your beer or coke or whatever, and, and talk to other people and be right in amongst the bikes. And he said, yeah, but you can't do that. And I said, yeah, I know that that would be the perfect deal. Well, you know, we did it. We got it done. And uh, the pictures keep coming up here of your Sunday. Sunday traditions, and it's although there are so many people there, that's, and that's the tourist spot. Yeah, that is. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so even though there are so many people there on Sundays, it still has a very like, family atmosphere, and you do employ pretty much everyone in your family. How is that working with your family? Working with your family is really good in that you can trust them. You know, you know that they're not going to be stealing from you. You know that they're going to have your best interests at heart. But it's also very hard in that if an employee disagrees with you, oh well, who cares? If your parents or your, your family disagrees with you, you got to hear about it. They're going to argue with you. You know, and I've got my wife works there, my mom works there, my sister, my brother-in-law. You know, I've got five kids. They all work up there. So it's uh, it's good to have them there. But it's, uh, you know, they got a lot of jaw in there as well. I think it's a TV show. Yes. Um, it's quite um, What makes you want to go to work each day if you do work every day? Uh, you know, it, it, I believe that if you love what you do for a living, it's not really like working, you know, and, and, and y'all are going to have jobs that you don't like to go to work. It's not working. You know, I tell my boys, if you don't like working here, Go find a job somewhere else. I promise y'all be okay. Don't worry about me. And it's the same thing. You know, you, if you don't love your, your job, then working that eight, nine hours a day is miserable. You know, so you have to, I think, you have to love your job. When I worked for Glidden, I loved it. I loved working there for, for years and years, but when I saw a better opportunity, I went to it. Do you have a favorite part of your day? I get to work about 5.30, quarter to 6 in the morning. And that's my favorite part of it because there's no phones ringing, you know, there's no hey Riggs, hey Riggs, hey Riggs, it's just, it's just me and I get my paperwork done, you know, and that's my, my favorite time of the day is early morning. And what's your motto? Get up early, work hard all day and good things will happen. And it's it's true. I try to tell my five kids that. They don't listen, but that's what I tell them. <laughs> um, what has been one of your toughest business you know, I think every day is a tough decision because, you know, the, the, any business, whether it was when I was in the, in the paint business or the motorcycle business, it's like a fire drill. You know, when you're, when you're the boss, it's like, okay, you're putting out fires and you have all these different things going wrong. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what decisions do you make? You know, you're going to make good decisions and bad decisions, and hopefully you're making more good decisions than bad. But the, the secret is to surround yourself with good people that know as much or more than you do, put them in charge of the department, and then let them run that. And that's what I try to do. Thank you.
where do you see your business going for the next year and then even for the next few years? Uh, you know, I'm just trying to do a steady growth. You know, I want my, my place is, is kind of self-contained now. But like I said, I just bought the, the building, so it's going to be even bigger and better. You know, it's, it's, I just want it to be a fun place to hang out where people can come and have a good time because they're there every single week. And with the, with the TV show, we get people there from all over the, all over the world. You know, I gave a tour of, of a bunch of people from, uh, from uh, Italy two weeks ago. One of them spoke English, the other 13 or 14 didn't speak English. But it's, you know, they, they've seen the TV show and they've seen, you know, some of my bikes in the magazine. And it's just, uh, you know, we're trying to build on what we have. You know, you don't start out at the top. When I first started, it was like, you know, the Harley shop said, oh, this goofball, you know, he don't know what he's doing. You know, it's, it's, I didn't know what I was doing. Really. You, know, you, just, you just work your way. And it's what I try to tell my employees is that the difference between selling paint and selling motorcycles is the product. Everything else is the same. The product is changed. So what would be your advice then um, about running a successful business? Your secret? You know, it's, you, I believe that you get out of uh, business what you put into it. You know, if a guy's looking for, you know, hey, I'm going to work at night, I'm going to work to work at work five or six o'clock, that's what you're going to get out of it, you know, but if, if, you, if you work your ass off, I can go up and lock those there, you know, I, I believe that you can, you can get out of it what you put into it. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And it's like when I was at, at Glidden, and I'd be the number one salesman, they would ask me to, to give a little speech, you know, and they'd have the big awards banquet, and I'd always say, you know what, I'm, I'm not smarter than y'all. I'm probably not as smart as y'all. I just outwork it. And it's the same way in the motorcycle business. I just outwork my competitors. Um, do you have a favorite business story or do you have a favorite story about an employee? I know uh, some of the favorites have been turned into Yeah, I've got a guy that, that works for me. His name is Frank Williams, and he's, he's on my show. He's, he's been a friend of mine for 25 years. Guy's 53 years old. He's got long gray hair, long beard. And, you know, he begged me and begged me for a job. So I hired him, I put him in parts. He was worthless. Moved him back to be service rider. He worked there for six months. He was worthless. But I couldn't fire him, you know, because he was my pal. So he, he said, hey, I see you need a new salesman. Let me be a salesman. I said, you know, you, you know he doesn't look like a salesman. He looks like an old, an old biker. I'm like me, only older than us here. So he said, let me try sales, let me try sales. And I said, okay, but this is your last stop. The guy's like a selling machine, best best salesman I've ever had. He just, uh, you know, he gets out there and he talks to the customers and he hangs out with them. And, you know, he does a really good job. Are you concerned your best employee or the other people who are? You know, I have a bunch of best employees, I think. You know, I've got a bunch of good ones. You know, and I've had a bunch of bad ones, but, uh, you know, I've got a bunch of, a bunch of really good employees. Um, maybe some more personal questions away from the business. Um, what is your, or where, I guess, is your favorite place to ride? Why do you have, why do you like driving? I go to uh, the big rally in Sturgis, South Dakota every year, which is up by Rapid City. The little town is 5,000 people, but during, uh, during this bike week,